And we're now we're live. What's up, Kingdom of Rock? This is Matt Gibson on a one second delayed start. But, but. Got, let, wait, let, let's do a take two, Matt. Start over. Come on. All right, take two for the podcast. That's right. What's go. up, Kingdom of Rock? This is Matt Gibson. And it is what is it today, Michael? The first of something. I know. The man. first of COVID. It's, it's like October first already. This year is just flying by, which I guess is good because this year kind of sucks, but it's crazy how fast things are going. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it is. And we're here today with uh, Janelle Burdell, drummer extraordinaire, health and wellness uh, expert and meditation guru. How's it going, Janelle? <laughs> well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. It's an awesome honor. You guys are rocking it. Dude, yeah. I... I was talking to Janelle earlier. She just put out this really cool um, drum video. It's kind of a meditative, like, you know, how to de-stress yourself video. And you're, what, what is the drum? Call? It's an Udu drum. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's she, the Udu drum. I mean, Michael, knows I've mainly played drum set most of my life in my career. Of course, some percussion. And then I interacted with this Udu drum and it sort of sucked me in the sound. So I've been working on a lot of different things, but it wasn't until COVID hit that I realized the waves of anxiety were sweeping over me. I now needed to do, drink some of my own medicine and figure out a way of not just helping people to meditate, how to meditate with a minute, but to say, oh, we're too busy for that. We need it even shorter. How long does it take to actually have your mind Shift focus while you're listening to these grooves, these time slow, very working with my own breath. And bam, I started posting them. And I think I've got 37 up now. And I've more fans than I ever could imagine, more Spotify streams, more money raised to protect my drums. You know, like I was talking with them with Michael, it's it's more about alignment of what the people meet. We talked about this, Matt, what the people need right now. They really mm -hmm. need that for music. So, yeah, thanks so for checking that out. And, and you also not only have these tracks that people can kind of listen to and calm down, but I, when you kind of encourage people to buy Udus themselves and kind of play along with you or, or practice breathing Absolutely. and all that as well. I mean, with the group drumming thing that I got into with the back in the day of the Cuckoo, which led, of course, to me working with Mickey Hart mm -hmm. and kind of being on that vanguard with Rio and everybody of exploring group drumming. Um, you know, I realized the power of interactivity and really that everybody did want involved. So why not? They get the benefit 10 times more when you participate. And that's true of. You could say it in life, democracy or whatever. Or you got to participate. You've got to play, you know, and then you get the benefit a lot more, I think. Don't you? Well, I mean, maybe could you expound a little bit about how group drumming actually does affect one's mood and everything? I mean, I remember they used to have the, the group drum thing at NAMM and Anaheim and it used to scare the crap out of me. I used to run away from those that whole group, but you know, but maybe that's just the mood I was in. But I realize there is a something that happens when you all get together and play. Because as I was running past these people, I recognized the blissed out looks on their faces. So how does this actually happen? <laughs> I remember them well. Arthur Hogg, bless his heart, mm -hmm. the uh, drummer sort of credited and truthfully credited as the master who took a, a way of drumming from Africa, handed over through Baba and morphed into the group drumming for the general public. And then of course, Remo pulled in Christine Stevens, who I saw in an episode of yours, Matt, I think yeah. from earlier day great. maybe. And great she really yeah. brought the whole thing together and they made it legit with a doctor here near me in Pittsburgh, believe it or not. They drew blood and basically what they found, this research is so solid and so hip they found that after 20 minutes of this bilateral motion, which we are rhythm beings, we live in a rhythm world. This is Mickey Hart. We are vibration beings. We live in a vibrational world. But boom, you add in that participatory thing, Michael, where everyone's doing this and you literally, it's the way we move. It's the way we 
walk. It's the way we crawl. It's, mm -hmm. it's how we program our brain and it's how we can reprogram our brain. So what they found was after 20 minutes, it boosted your immune cells, it boosted your cancer fighting cells. We, I didn't even know we had them in our body. And then mm -hmm. later work with the human genome project showed that it actually reversed like 19 switches in the brain around anxiety, reversed it. Oh, so wow. you're talking about at that level of DNA, you're talking how you live, how you die. And then boom, and even my favorite part is how what it does to the group. After the group leaves, after six weeks of doing something together, my, not the NAM things, but actually working together, the individuals, this is powerful, change. They start to show up more for the, they start to show up more for their family. They start to show up more for themselves and basically they're showing up. So to me, that's what we want in our world right now a way to, for people to change. We can't just point the finger and we need to give them a way to change where we're not monitoring them to do it. You know? So I feel it's like the most powerful thing. I'm like out here like the Pied Piper throwing drums in everyone's hands saying, hey, do this. You know, or I was until COVID hit, right? Now we're online. Yeah. Is this a, a nutshell. Is this an everyday thing where you have to do this every day for this to work to get all these switches realigned and everything? Well, 20, you know, 20 minutes is something that I think it is you have to do it again. I mean, when medicine runs out, you do you take another pill? So I think that in our world it means to pick up our instrument again and do it again, you know, until that becomes the fun. Now think of it this way because I do Actually, life is is a rhythm, right? From the time we wake up, we get out of bed. I get out of bed on the left, go into the bathroom. I go to the bathroom. I wash my face. I brush my teeth. I come back in. I make my bed. And then I go down for coffee. And that's almost every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we are rhythm beings. So once you're starting to become aware of how rhythm works in your life and in your body, and you become well-practiced, musicians that's what we do we're well practiced right if we could do that in our daily life you can really uh see how it can enhance your experience here so that's what i talk about a lot in my workshops and programs and i try to make a very real rhythm like oh the trees make what we need make what the trees need the trees make what we need we make it with the kids you take away the trees What's going to happen? Are we going to survive? No, they say. <laughs> so I'm trying to really make it real. So why while you're describing this, and I'm sure someone has done this in another space. I don't think they've done this in metal yet. So I'm a metal artist, <laughs> a rock guy. And no, what I'm thinking is it's the idea of participative music. And if you think about it, back in the day, music was more participative because you would open up the album, you know, for vinyl. You would you would read the notes. You'd pull out the stuff from your cassette tape or whatever, and you would read all the all the thing, the lyrics and things like that. And there was that tactile like participation in the music, visual touch, smell. You smell the old. If you're a collector now, you smell the old vinyl you know and stuff like that and what what kind of struck me uh interesting mm -hmm. and I, again i'm sure someone's done this in some capacity probably you have too if you make it so that your music always has a participative element in what in the experience so like you, like you could almost say like you know a lot of times i think vi did those um those tracks where he took the lead guitar out of the uh, by tunes. He took the lead guitar out of the uh, all of his tracks so that people could just kind of play along, which that's cool and that's fun guitar, but it's not quite as therapeutic as the rhythmic thing that you're talking about, I bet. And and maybe certain sounds or certain instruments or certain you know experiences, whatever it is that would cause a person to kind of detach from their anxiety, their worry, their stress, you know, and uh, kind of unplug. But like how, if you took that to the extreme where all music has participative elements, 
like that's an expectation. Like, I wonder how you could do that with, with drums and, well, and- I mean, it started out that way, you know, even before, you know, the true bears of France, you know, the folk music musicians throughout the Dust Bowl where everybody kind of got to get, you know, before radio and all that, people got together in a house and somebody played the piano and they sung songs together. I mean, that's, right. that's where we come from too. We've kind of forgotten that as we've, you know, grown into, you know, our own houses and stuff like that and things become a little more, you know, kids move away, neighborhoods don't necessarily come together anymore to sing songs, you know. Right. This, this well, there's a, it's interesting that you're saying that because there's kind of an twofold you're right culturally we've been doing it for years and we've gotten away from it as we started becoming professional about our job and that's also the separation that happens at nam between the drum circle group and what's happening right? so you feel like oh even i went through this with the cuckoo and then i realized after my very first drum circle with them and saw people changing before my eyes i thought holy shit this is really incredible and powerful stuff. And it resonates with the research because the research, this motion alone is great, but mm -hmm. the number skyrocketed once you did it in a group. So there's something about element. And with metal, we could say live shows. I think of live shows where metal fans and all of us has yeah, you're like, the deadheads, the deadheads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the whole you know, it's the whole vibe of what's happening in the event. And now we have to make it in this little cube that we're in right now with these little squares, what if, Hollywood square. But what if you did something with a music manufacturing company, like a drum company or, or um, uh, some type of percussion instruments. And when you buy the album, you, you get like half off on a participation instrument of your choice. And then it comes with yeah, like I'm a way to, to teach. Right now. Yeah. yeah, she's actually trying to get this happening. Do you, you know? know. It yeah. seems perfect, you know, really. I'm getting requests now, oddly, from all over the world for workshops and lessons. And it's been amazing. Since. So if you're out there and now LPs with DW. So I'm, just, I'm, I'm making some calls and talking to some people. And like you said, Pos podcasts like this can help to let them know what you're doing with the instruments yeah well the, the other thing as far as you know drum circles i, I don't get that you know matt and i one of the underlying themes of some mm -hmm. talk about is, is the presence of ego in musicians and i think when you're doing a drum circle no one's really you know you're not sitting next to someone going i'm going to kick this guy's ass on a paradiddle you know i'm going to be better than that <laughs> over there you know right. but if you have like a metal jam session or a blues jam session you know there's always someone who's trying to cut somebody you know it's not right communal at all you know you're together yeah. and sharing Beating them yeah. everybody's trying to beat down somebody yeah. else so that they're better this is and, not and, the, the and also, go ahead go ahead they're also trying to <laughs> ruffle their feathers <laughs> and attract the the girls i'm sorry. we lost so, you okay oh, yeah. are you there we can see you. I don't know. Get, have you, Are you there? Time? I'm here. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, okay. we're good. You just can't there's, see it. A little little yeah. internet storm there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, exactly. Go ahead, Janelle. Go. I'll, I'll you. No, no. I'm on that, Michael. I mean, how to take it into metal? There's a lot of different ways. The bottom line is, you know, they do it when. You know, listening, I encourage people to walk and listen to pot, you know, listen in your ear. And and the key is to swing your arms, man. It creates this feeling of general well-being throughout your whole body where all your systems work in harmony rather than one being out of harmony and you get dis-ease, you know. So it's very simple when you think of life more in terms of rhythm and you know, how it can enhance your life and your experience. It's really pretty profound and yet fun. But you're right. The ego, Michael, is what's at stake and it's always present. Like I said, drum circles, one of the things with women 
is boom, a guy comes in and wants to ruffle his feathers, you know, and impre impress the girls. So then the women cower, they don't feel safe to play. So it's been this kind of relationship with women and drumming throughout time. You know, hopefully hmm. what we're doing is proceeds to empower women like at IMA and different, um, Mm -hmm. different hit like a girl contest you know everything like that to really empower them and find their voice believe it or not it's not just about hitting drums you know it's really your voice like culturally that gets so weird because um janelle is actually a, a staffer on one of my new content things which is called now gen drums which basically is about empowering women and young people whether they're male or female just to you know right. be as bad as they can be, you know, who cares? But right. it is funny that, you know, there are so many awesome women drummers mm -hmm. out there. And mm -hmm. I mean, do you see that in, in a male scenario that it, it, they kind of retreat a, a little bit? Or, 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 I mean, what's going on with that? In a male scenario? I'm sorry, I don't really understand or, that or last part. Uh, let's say two drummers show up, uh, you know, two trap drummers, a male drummer, a female drummer. Female drummer's awesome, male drummer's awesome. Do, do you feel that there's still that goes on in that relationship with musicians where female musicians sometimes feel a bit intimidated by the maleness of typical the bandstand or something? It can be, you know, usually the, the thing always comes down to once they hear you play, it's a different game, it's a different story. You know, Are you gig after gig like that? And once they hear you play, the bass player turns around and says, hey, my name is blah, 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 you know? And it's like, oh. But that, but that, that's kind of messed up too. Like if if Matt and I walked into a jam session, they would just accept us as players, you know? Why would a woman have to like prove that she can play before the bass player goes, okay, you and I are going to be all right now? We're well-practiced. I know the answer that's to that. Like <laughs> I'm sorry, you're well-practiced at what? As a, as a We're well practiced at, at the, doing it that way. That's all. I just think it's going to take time to change and it's not going to be a switch. Yeah, I, it is. As it, a single guy, I have an opinion about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Single. Single. All right. So it, what it is, is you have to decide what category this woman is in. Is she a potential girlfriend or a member of the band like and it's kind of, once the member of the band gets established that's cool but it's like your guys a lot of guys are just trying to they just don't know they're like i what do i how do i respond how do i react to this person and you think you know everyone says oh just be yourself or whatever it's like no it is a little bit complicated there is men and women are different we have different roles and parts and stuff you know like everything's different and so, we, but music brings us together. And so like when a female comes into an all male environment, it's like, okay, here's a, here's a foreign uh, entity. That's not like us. We're tribe tribal, you know, we're like, Ooh, you know, like I'm thinking like Tim, the tool man, Taylor. And then you're like, what, how do I, what am I supposed to do? She's pretty. Is that, is that going to be my girlfriend or is that going to be my a bass player or guitar player? And I don't know. That's just maybe one person's possible explanation. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've dynamic. played, in, you know, because I'm an old hippie. I mean, I've played in a gazillion <laughs> band, a gazillion, you know, bands of all sexes. And, you know, I've never walked in there going, oh, I want this woman to be my girlfriend. Or I want to have sex with her. You know, it's, it's basically the music is important. You know, whatever happened after that, all right, that's whatever happens. But, <laughs> but, but for me, it's been more about, it's hard to be open sometimes because uh, so, these are early days too, like when women were basically not very respected, you know, the seventies and the eighties and, you know, like that, yeah. um, you know, it was hard because if I was open, I still had barriers to get across because the, the woman might go, eh, this guy doesn't respect me or, and eh, this guy wants to get in bed with me or, and eh, this guy just wants me because I'm pretty and they need a, a, something to be, look cooler on the bandstand. It, it, was sometimes difficult to go, no, I really love how you play and that's why you're here. You know, it was hard to get to that point. You probably yeah, had a lot of it's hard where, you know. What what do you it's think, Janelle? Woman, it's hard as a woman to get away from what Matt said, that everyone's looking at you from as two positions. You're either in the band or I'm gonna fuck 
excuse me. You're going to go right. to be my girlfriend or we're going to go to bed. Right? I mean, really, I'm just being honest and real. As a drummer, I've surely hung in the guy's locker room long enough to realize that's what the game is. And right. that. And, you know, things are starting to change. So from this generation on, our young boys, hopefully we're able to, you know, encourage them in ways that respect women, strong women, um, not the picture-perfect, brush-stroked, photoshopped woman. Uh, I think the more we start planting that seed in our young boys, that's why I work with mothers a lot and homeless mm -hmm. children mothers i want to get to the mothers because they're getting our kids basically and it's going to take a lot i mean i get this struggle right now with me too and yet the awareness is every woman has through it so that should say something mm -hmm. that there needs to be another way we need to find a third category matt can i just be your friend first and then see yeah. what happens to the next step you know well, you, that's the way like, my little kid, my little kid wants to be like that yeah well if, if maybe it's back to the schoolyard you know what i yeah. mean like when we're little kids like out on the playground and you know it it was a little bit less complicated it, it seems that way a little less complicated you know i remember when i was like well pre maybe seven exactly. or yeah that's what i mean that's what i mean like seven <laughs> or eight years old i had this girl come over and she played with all my toys and she i used to have this little, little disney projector that you could you know look through the thing and you turn this thing and a lot of kids had it my age and uh, she jammed the cartridge into there and I couldn't get it out and I was mad at her. But it was like, it wasn't, it was just like, we're friends, you know, we're just yeah. friends playing and hanging, but it was like, you know, yeah, I totally agree with you. But, but at the same yeah. time, we, we also have to, we can't be like ign ignorant of the fact that there is that element when you become grownups that is is not present when you're a kid so like sexual yeah. chemistry and romance and relationships and people so i guess it's like our culture it it does especially in america it's kind of a little bit of a male pig uh mentality in a lot of ways you know well, where it's, it's this, because we glorify sexuality and we use it to to sell things and we make it more important than it actually is. People are more important. The individual person is more important than that layer of them, you know? And uh, what do you think, Mike? Well, Toby first? Simmons, thanks for commenting, Toby, by the way, said uh, there are so many male, female guitar legends too, which which is getting to that point. But, you know, yeah. in, the, in the 20 plus years I was editor of Guitar Player Magazine, it, it was tough to get women on an equal footing with men. You know, it was tough because sometimes um, there'd be the, well, she doesn't play as hard as somebody else. You know, she's not rocking. It's her, she's too, you know, and, and not that there aren't male guitar players that, you know, play very lightly and delicately, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but there would always be discussions about why we could or couldn't cover somebody. And then out in the, the field even, um, you know, uh, there were a lot of women. It was tough on them. You know, name 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 a female guitarist that came up in the '70s or '80s or '90s, and they'll tell you it was not awesome for the most part. And some are still experiencing this this today. Bonnie and, uh, Ray, what do you um, think Bonnie Ray would be a good example. I, I did a I did a rocker girl conference once, and I just you know I was the only male on the panel, and I just got barrage by you know women saying you know you guitar player sucks you don't listen to us you know blah. and and i said well how many of you have actually sent a demo into the magazine or how many of you have actually called me and said i've got a record out or i'm in a band i think you should cover me total silence now mm -hmm. it wasn't that made me happy that i was trying to absolve myself of being a male pig it kind of made me sad because they didn't feel that they had permission to ask the magazine to send their stuff in, which was super sad because it's about guitar players, whether you're dogs or women, men, aliens, whatever, you know? 
Well, yeah, Matt, you know, we're talking about guys being more sensitive, but I think it's a twofold thing. You know, we've also got a girls, which is what I'm really active with, with June Millington at her school at IMA and the girl rock camps that I've been involved with mm -hmm. about empowering them. The quality I just shared with you that playing an instrument for a girl, the way that we're raised culturally at this point, gives them their voice. June yeah. will tell you in her book. I mean, they grabbed guitars at 19 and they couldn't believe the sound that was coming out of their mouth. I think she says it that way. Yeah. Or out of or whatever. And if they stayed with it and didn't get pregnant and didn't get married, think about it, or didn't get stopped by their father or their boyfriend for playing, which like the girl Fanny did and a lot of other women, Bertha, more and more. You know, you see them sticking with it and becoming that strong player. But let me tell you, like I've told Michael, I've played with some of these legends and I know how, what they did when they found me. They were excited. They called each other because we found someone. Mm -hmm. And then when I found like Ariana Powell down in L.A., she's now she was back in Pittsburgh. I just believe me, the first gig I did with her, she blew a dinner crowd away and on four courses of, um, oh, I'm getting dinged here, right and left. And she blew the, blew the walls down on At Last and the whole restaurant was uh, standing up and I thought, she's the next one, you know, she's it. And I knew it. And, you know, Jennifer Batten, June, you could go down the list every so often. But I think more and more, you're going to find more of us showing up and and lifting us up to be stronger. Does that make sense? Collectively. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that I think that's what you want is you just want everybody to be, you know, in a certain sense. I mean, it's never gonna go away. You know, the music industry is always gonna be competitive. So I mean, I, I I'm not naive enough to think that I'm not this much of a hippie map where I think that everyone's gonna walk around with flowers in their hair and go, Oh, we don't care if you think we're awesome, we just all wanna be awesome. Let's hug. You know, that's probably not gonna happen. There's always gonna be someone who's gonna try to, you know, cut somebody else. But for the most part, if we can just get it to the point where yeah, we're all awesome because we're here playing and sharing music and we're not being rated on whether you're pretty or not pretty or, or you know, sexified or, and this goes both ways too. Same with, you know, women looking at men and vice versa. It's just like you walk into the room and music is the altar. Everybody get, gathers around that. You do your thing. What happens outside the rehearsal room, that's a whole nother deal, you know. Now let's look at RBG, rest in peace, you know woman but I believe if we go back she was instrumental some of her th uh, law and and her cases were instrumental in creating came the you know the curtain test I mean that was a big deal in uh symphonies once they dropped the curtain and it couldn't pretend that they knew the difference between a guy and a girl because that's what they were doing they were saying i knew that i could tell the difference she isn't going to hit hard she mm -hmm. isn't going to whatever you know but once you drop the curtain they couldn't freaking tell okay that's that yeah. changed everything yeah yeah well it was it was even yeah. you know we would get these you know arguments about uh in the early days well when i was at guitar play early oh you know tube amps are better than digital amps. And, you know, I would always mess people up like saying, well, let's do a double blind test. Let's play this back. And I won't tell you what guitar was recorded with what. And you just tell me, cause you can tell, cause you know the difference between a tube amp and a digital amp, which is which. And, you know, some people could figure, figure it out who had great ears, you know, but, but for the most part, nobody could figure it out. And I think it's the same thing with records. If I played a record and said, man, this guitar player is awesome. I didn't, I don't tell you whether it's a male or a female or a dog or an alien. And, you know, if you just rate it like, oh, that is awesome. Oh, but yeah, it's a girl. It's a 15 year old mm -hmm. girl. That awesome. You know, I mean, I think those, you're right. The curtain test is really I mean, the deal. So, so, okay. So check this out. Culturally, and maybe I'm stepping on a little bit sensitive ground here, but I'm just going to put it out there. Culturally, like for me, Vixen, look, okay, Vixen is from the 80s. They're all, all girl, all female rock band, very talented ladies, all great musicians, great songs, everything, right? 
there's something about my makeup as a male that while I don't, I listen to it and I'm like, yeah, that's good music. I like it. If my friends are over, I'm not going to put on Vixen because they're all going to make fun of me. Right. So oh, wow. there's some element there. There's some element there. I don't know if it's genre specific or how old you are or whatever it is, but there's something tribal that goes on there when, when, because music, some people, many people use music to brand themselves. So like, that's why you see some, you know, pop star wearing a Metallica shirt that's never listened to Metallica because it's cool to have that raw, like, yeah, Metallica, mm -hmm. right? You know, and it's part of their branding. And mm -hmm. it's like, so it kind of depends on the vibe of that person and what they're doing. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's an element that's there. Well, and, I don't even, and what I mean, you do with that, like, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're musicians. And I mean, this is getting me coming up with the punk aesthetic, obviously. But I, I could care less what anybody thinks about me. You know, if you want to be my friend, that's awesome. If you don't want to be my friend, step off. I do not care. I literally do not give a shit about what anybody thinks about me. So forget <laughs> about women and men. If you're over my house- I and like I Beyonce. I, I, might, I might put on Herman's Hermits <laughs> and you might go, what are you playing this jinky stuff for? And I might go, because I like no milk today. Deal with it, dude. You know? I think I think an element of that too. If we stop worrying about what people are going to think about us and just, you know, celebrate what we love, no problem. You know, I I like Destiny's Child. Like I love their songs. I love I the, the. I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> I you should because it it goes again. You know, it's it's part of it is you know I grew up in the '80s, and the '80s had genre hate. Like if you were metal, you hated hip hop and R&B artists. Now, not probably not the ones that lived in L.A., you know, but like out in the the norm, the world that's not the entertainment business. Right. It was, you know, like it, we were battling and you would see it in all the publications. They would use that yin and yang, you know, thing to kind of like create tension and, you know, get some hype going on and stuff like that, you know. But it's like the. <laughs> It's just marketing it's and his, but it, Well, true, but but back when there were less channels, like when you like, for example, twenty years ago, Guitar Player Magazine in two thousand was probably a uh, a tastemaker. You know what I'm saying? And it still is, but I, I'm saying it's the 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 like okay. So you got three TV stations. You got your local radio station, depending on what size city you live in and and some magazines and uh some newspapers right and 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 talk radio and so like those were the mediums that you could become known on right mm -hmm. now there are billions literally billions probably trillions of mediums that you could become more known on and i think the, the further you go back towards the 70s and earlier where there were almost no options you know, gatekeepers, you had to go through a record label to get, you know, to the top and be out there and all this stuff. Like it, it created a, a, a branding inside of our brains that where it's, it's like, this is, we're either against the system or we're for it, you know? And it's like, like Mike, Michael, you know, being a punk rocker, he was probably the against the system guy, you know, do your own thing. Don't oh. give a shit what anybody thinks, but I was a conformist. I was trying to create a space for myself in the, the rock aesthetic, you know, in the eighties and I was a rocker. And so like surprise, right. You know, so, yeah. but well, it's, I, I don't, I don't know, like all of that together creates why we have, why we think the way that we think that's part of Absolutely. it. You know, and I'm just saying Absolutely. that's part of me. Well, I think, I think, I think everybody's different. I mean, like Janelle and I being starting our careers a little, earlier than you it's like you know yes there's way more channels now no argument but it wasn't like there was no channels when we were starting out we had to fight 
a lot you know, to be heard. There was still a lot of people on your shoulders, you know, that you had to get through. Yeah. But how did you through. find out what was cool? I'm sorry. How did you find out what was cool or did you just make up cool at your own thing? Like there's, there's people that go look for what's cool. Yeah. And they well, try to me, fit in. For me, it was probably television. Wasn't it the same for you, Janelle? Cause you know, we'd watch TV and see these cool yeah. bands. I mean, oh, man. That's cool. But, but it yeah. wasn't a marketing person telling me you should think this cool. It's like, I would see, you know, like when we had Redbone on, I saw them on the, Midnight Special in the seventies. I thought, man, this is cool. You know, I, th I think I got a lot of my coolness from just seeing people on television because that was my internet. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think something was cool because, uh, you know, somebody told me or some, you know, Madison Avenue guy said or girl said, yeah, man, you should really love Redbone. They're the, they're the shit. Yeah, I mean, I think they would be mean, right. They would be right if they told you that. Wasn't it the same for uh, you? Guys? Yeah, I think. Those mediums those were the way that we heard and got the information. Like I can remember watching. I can, I taped Jennifer Batten actually saying that seeing June Millington with Fanny on the first Sunny and Cher show at the age of six that gave her the idea that she could. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like until you see it as someone who's real, it's not friggin' real. Okay, it's not possible. Everyone in my my generation, my family said, you need to stay here and have 2.2 kids and do this. And, you know, and I was like, are you crazy? Yeah. So once I made that decision to move and, and again, Matt, what you're talking about with Vixen back a few beats in our conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. is also that the culture of the generation that we all come from right? The boys club, the way it's been, the girls disempowered voices, the way we were talking about. So today, very much in alignment with what uh, Arthur Hall is saying about the building a rhythm of culture, we need to plant seeds for a different culture. Start that's a good, functioning that's in a good. more respectful, a sustainable like way, you know? And I see in the Bay Area an unusual amount because there are so many strong women Women musicians are such a big thing there and New York, probably the two biggest areas for so long. Those women were raising boys differently and they feel differently. Even though Michael's older than you, he feels differently about it than a guy raised in the he's in the Midwest. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. yeah. But, well, that, that, is, that is true because you're right. There were, there were a crap ton of female musicians in San Francisco. So it wasn't that it was strength. Our player, the whole women's women women. music woman. Sorry, what? There, the there music, were. Yeah. Whole music, women's music movement happened out of San Francisco. I mean, that was pre the Indigo Girls. As mm -hmm. soon as Tracy Chapman hit and the Indigo Girls hit, the women's music scene started dying out because we didn't need to. We were crossing over now. That's a huge part of music history in my world. I was part of it. I was a kid on the streets of Pittsburgh playing jazz and got picked up by June Millington because I had played in a band for years with Vic Fan, who you guys know, right? Mm -hmm. And boom, it's word of mouth, kind of like, oh, you played with Vicky? Well, I know Vicky. Well, then you must be a player. And you see what I mean? Then it goes from there. But now it's a whole different game. I mean, I have women approaching me from hit like a girl contest and they're getting, like you said, of endorsements and sponsorship. And maybe they haven't done as many gigs, you know, maybe not. they've never done gigs on a certain level yet. That doesn't mean it's not. Valid. It's just a different way that we're getting the information. And I think that the key, what I've decided to do is to reach out and shake their hands and share. And it's, mm -hmm. It's difficult. Sometimes they're like, what are you talking about? I know what I'm talking about. I'm like, well, listen, there were two people before you saying that. And let me tell you, you know. Well, so yeah, it's filling the dots a lot with the internet. It's filling the blanks a lot. It's filling the information of the lineage. And I think that's cool about now, Jen and Michael, is you're mm -hmm. trying to bring uh, light to a lot of different kinds of drummers who just didn't catch that light. That doesn't mean there aren't great drummers 
in Baltimore. That doesn't mean there aren't great drummers regionally in wherever the Midwest. They are. They are. We had the, the difference, Matt, was we had a club scene. You didn't have that. We had no, a scene. I, the could go and play in and my school something. were in a band. Yeah. They, they were in the high school scene, band. And that's a huge difference. What did, yeah. what did you say? The kids what? I was saying the girls, the female musicians during the 80s that I, as far as I can remember, were mostly in the high school band or the choir. Like, that's it. The rock band. Well, they were, were all playing boys. punk in San Francisco. They were playing punk like Frightwig in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Something like right. that, like radical. But, but I grew up in Indiana. So, like, and yeah. that's not the most progressive place in the world. Um, but yeah, I, even, I will say, like from the eighties, what? No, you just said. Go ahead, Mike. Just enlarging upon this, and and then I, I need to get to something else with Janelle that I think is interesting. We should talk about, but you know, Dirk Dirksen, who ran the Mabuhai Gardens, was the Punk Palace. He used to make you show up at the club for booking days, and he'd have his little clipboard and roll it out and say, you know. Okay, here's all the headliners, who wants to fill in? And and at first it was like such a pain in the ass to drive down to Broadway in San Francisco. There's never any parking. Crawl into this club with a hundred bands in it. And but I realized how how powerful that was for the community because we had to be there with each other to get the show. So we were interacting, we were talking, a lot of women, a lot of women's bands, a lot of men, a lot of uh, it wasn't just all, you know, white people either. It was, you know, the Asian bands and, you know, uh, Latino bands and, you know, black punk bands and stuff like that. And it was really a little melting pot. And it was forced upon us. If you wanted a gig, you had to interact with this community. Yeah. Good way of putting it. Well, the other thing I want to talk about, you know, you have some experience, Chanel, that I don't think we've had on the show yet, but uh, you've actually played in a lot of Broadway shows. And I think it would be interesting yeah. for, you know, aspiring drummers or aspiring musicians to hear what it's yeah. like to actually be on a big Broadway show, what that's like. Yeah, interesting. You know, as a, a lot of my career, I always say my whole career, I'm I'm very, uh, I've often felt like a jack of all trades, master of none, because I'm so versatile and my experience touches so many different angles of the industry. It's a bit unusual, you know, but each one of them was because of needing the gig and pain. So the fire in my belly, I call it, right? So it leads me to evolve and say, oh, wow, I could do that, a Polynesian show, sure. You know, I could do that a show. Bam, what do I got to do? Sure, say yes, figure it out. I kind of knew enough about percussion to, to figure it out if I could have something in advance, a book. So what I was doing was I was in Pittsburgh and I had nudged my way into Carnegie Mellon University drama because I wanted a steady day gig playing dance classes. And I got involved with one of the greatest drama musical theater schools in the world. I mean, it's, like, it's too numerous to mention how many of our favorite stars uh, went through there. And um, that was a great source of connections that long-term came back around. Like I was a young kid and then I moved to the Bay Area and got pulled out there working with June and with Dukuku and bam, it was, um, leading towards, I worked with Mickey Hart and then the dead and each one of them, I think of like as small projects or gigs, not what we call a production contract. And then boom, one of the kids that I did every 30 shows with for 30 bucks and beer gets the gig for beauty and the beast as the conductor and calls me out. Why? Because he knows I'm going to be reliable. I'm going to show up job really well. And at nine o'clock in the morning, when he's got to rehearse the next orchestra, I'm going to really be there for him and understand it. And so it was more person you were even working with Mickey Hart was like that. It wasn't just chops and techniques or people could use the software faster than me, but who could create something creative that made him want to play? You know, things like that. More of my person, you want to be in the studio every day with someone you don't like, who's got an attitude? Are you kidding me? 
Mm-hmm. That isn't going to happen. Do you want to go on the road and sh- eight shows a week with somebody you don't like? You're the only people you know in every city, okay? Little pod goes city to city, and that's all you know. You don't really know anybody, and you become like a family out there. I mean, I would see people I haven't seen in 20 years, and it would be like yesterday, bam. You know, yeah. wow, because we had each other's back out there. So it's really challenging eight shows a week. People say, is that play the thing, same thing exactly every night? Well, first of all, you're not playing exactly because nothing can be exact except a machine. And second, after I spoke with Ariana Powell, after being out with the Black Eyed Peas, and now she's with Halsey and all these different people, we reconnected. I said, are you playing the same thing night? She went, yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. Because they want, they work the parts out already on the record. You have to play that. Mm-hmm. So I think that that once you rationalize that, now here's the bonus. At the time, we were under a union contract that had pension involved and everything. Since then, they've broken the union a lot, and it does still pay as a steady check. Don't get me wrong. And that adds up. But getting that pension benefit, I told Michael, surprised me day on COVID, I call in the pension fund. Hey, if things come back, I actually have a small little pension. Every mm-hmm. week, you know, month, I'll get thousand bucks or 1100 bucks if it holds on with the um, market and stuff like that that may not i was out for five years i did beauty and the beast which was a combined book of drum set and percussion and electronics so in Mm -hmm. our world every bit is an extra and you get paid and then i also got called to play little shop of horrors on broadway one time for the Mm -hmm. tour so i then took that tour out Together, it was about five years. And that's why I came back to Pittsburgh, because where are you going to go back to and get any work? Everybody's using different people, you know? So you have that kind of thing to look at. You're either looking for the next Mm -hmm. Broadway job, or you're going, oh, shit, what am I going to (laughs) do? You know, where am I going to go? And I I came back to Pittsburgh to launch Rhythm Games and lean into the music therapy thing. Is it is it difficult when you've got you know you're reading on these Broadway gigs? Of course, you've got a conductor, you've got the actors and singers, and there's choreography. Is it ever like you know? I mean, I would probably freak out and go, "How am I supposed to keep all of this to get together?" It's a lot to keep track of, you know. Yeah, at the level of Broadway, in different than community theater, I'm not reading. I have it memorized. I'm watching the conductor for every move because he synchronized watching the actor. And so that, you know, one of the biggest um, compliments was when I played for the tour, played Little Shop on Broadway and on the intermission, one of the actresses who played the urchins came down and said, I thought it was, I won't say the drummer's name, who's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I thought it was him under here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a woman drummer under here. I got to meet you. So Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I thought it was Rich up there playing, which told me it felt the same to her, which meant that I probably had the gig. You see, mm-hmm. I played his fills and everything the first time, exactly like he did for that reason. So I knew they wanted to be comfortable. So that was a really telltale sign. And then in her next breath, I said, oh, really? They know that I'm a woman drummer's down here? And she said, girl, everybody on Broadway knows there's a woman drummer in the pit today. You know, it's just was so unusual at that point. Fortunately, mm-hmm. now Dina Tarillo is was the last drummer with the rendition, the uh, revision of Little Shop. She mm-hmm. got the call first off. And that was really mm-hmm. exciting to me because here we bushwhack. We're the first ones. And then more can follow, mm-hmm. I think. What's that money bar quote? The first person through the wall always gets bloody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like Slick said that in the first uh, the documentary of Fanny that's coming out. It's awesome. And he's that exact same thing. He says, sometimes the first ones on the scene, man, take all the hits. Yeah. You know, you just have to do it. But you still do it because you love it. You love what you're doing every day, every moment. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to die raising 2.2 kids and die in a cute 
people or a job that I hated, like so many people do this right now, right now. And I think COVID is awesome for that because it's given us a chance to stop. And some people have realized, gosh, I really don't want to work like this anymore. Or I really yeah. want to be able to do more. Or maybe I could time offline half the week or whatever. And I think that's wonderful because I think we need more people being happy in at what they're doing now for our world to really change. You know, uh, I was talking to a, a very wealthy individual one time and he was talking to me about hiring people for his company. And he was, uh, he said, there's, there's four kinds of people in, that I hire in a company. They're smart and lazy, dumb and lazy, smart and hardworking, dumb and hardworking. He's like, now when I say dumb, I don't mean not intelligent. I just mean they're not, they don't have enough experience to do a higher level position or, you know, just kind of a short way of saying that. So he said, you know, the, 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 you'd think you would want a whole bunch of smart and hardworking people in your company. He's like, but you don't because they're going to burn themselves out and they're going to burn you out because they're going to try to do everything themselves mm -hmm. and, and just like burn out, you know, he's like, obviously dumb and lazy people. You want them out of your company like yesterday because they're going to ruin your company because they're going to sit in that chair and do nothing. And then, you know, uh, smart and lazy. Oh, it was the other hardworking and smart, hardworking and dumb. Yeah. When he said dumb and hardworking, he said, you know, he's talking about, you know, somebody that just does labor kind of like, you know, stacks a bunch of things on a table or something, you know, simple. Right. And then he's like, but the people that you really want to have around you in a company are the smart and lazy people because the smart and lazy people will use their brain to come up with the easiest way to multiply them, their time, their money, their resources so that they can go do what they actually want to do, which may be not, which could possibly not be the job that they're doing right now. So I think what COVID has done effectively is it's made everybody think about the value of being smart and lazy because you can, you don't have to go kill yourself and, and tore yourself into the ground to make a living there. It, what it's done is it's forced people to consider there's other ways to make income as an artist. There's other ways to, to make maybe easier than touring sometimes, you know, and, and I'm not saying anything bad about touring. I'm just saying it's, it's created the possibilities in, in artists minds that maybe kind of saw things through a more traditional climb the ladder, you know, earn your dues and, and that kind of thing, you know, so it's, it's kind of ratcheted us in the next level of, of thinking when it comes to being resourceful. I don't know. Well, we still have to find out. I mean, it's obvious that whoever you talk to, whether it's Steve Vai, Janelle, or some of the lower level, you know, B or C level musicians we've had on the show, it's like, you know, not being able to tour has been devastating to musicians' revenues. And yeah, that you can't get around that. It's just that you can't, you know, you can't, uh, you know, tech your way out of that or idea your way out of that. That's not quickly crazy. anyway. You could, you'd have to reinvent some things. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So, um, so yeah, that I guess we're still in that phase. But hopefully, as you mentioned, Matt, people are thinking, you know, taking the time to think about that. What is the next phase if we can't gig for another year? Uh, you know, hopefully, there's some smart, lazy people out there who are going. You know, I don't want to sit on my ass for a year. Plus, I got to make some money because I got to pay for my lawn or whatever. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, I was just uh, I was having lunch today with a pretty well known celebrity and uh, on t a television celebrity and uh we were just talking about you know what we could do to get music going you know in la and you know i th i think what maybe we're going to do is try to figure out a way to make some kingdom of rock shows and just invite artists that have been on the show to kind of you know just be a part of it you know we've got we've had drive-in um a who who's the guy with the drive-in um Randy shows? yeah randy yeah randy came on he was talking about how they have drive-in shows and there's there's so many different options we could do a little yeah. pop-up show somewhere that maintains figures out a way to maintain social distancing or whatever and he's like man i would i'd emcee that 
and this is like somebody that like a lot of people know. So I'm like, wow, that's cool. I, I think there's a lot of people in entertainment right now yeah. that that are just itching to do something that is not sit in their house and eat cake, even though that is fun, you know. You know, I think the the smaller shows, the porch French porch shows. I know in Pittsburgh, there's a jazz uh, singer and great bass player husband. Started, they did it on their own, on their block, and people started coming with their lawn chairs, and they sell CDs every Sunday night. And then, as you know, the weather was nice, they invited a drummer to play or whatever. It's going to be more homebrew kind of thing. In this yeah. phase of that transition, we have to keep playing live. Now, me, I would do that and throw out egg shakers to everyone. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. Now they're participating yeah. with us and they're getting that kind of vibe. That brings in a whole nother element that you can throw into it. There are ways to do it. There are ways to teach in this box type situation. You pretty much have to let go of the old way we did it and really let your mind get creative with it and collaborative, which is what you guys are doing, which is so cool. Thank you. Trying. You know, it's funny. It just reminded me, you know, my, my little uh, punk monkeys tribute band opened up for LA guns once before. And one of the things we do is we throw out uh, uh, Mara you know, toy maracas to play, uh, um, yeah. you know, Dave Lever. And I looked out and I saw this super metal guy, you know, his hair, you know, Everything's pierced, his face is tattooed, and he's got these little Moroccan going, cheer up, sleep. You know, he's just singing, and it was it was amazing how you know you'd think that the last thing that person wanted to do is even be in the same room as us, but but when you do offer, hey, let's play together, it's a pretty powerful thing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing in drum circles that I've facilitated. I've seen with Mohawk Mohawk type hair to do when you're 20, 40 minutes into a circle and they're holding up the djembe for like a 76 year old woman who's playing along who they might not even friggin' talk to in any other moment in time. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, true. Because the music and the rhythm and the, the whole of it has just got them in a trance and this motion really does send you quickly. You know, and it's not hard to get people to get connected to their inner rhythm because most of the time they've been told that they have to do that. It's really more of a mind thing than anything. So once they get involved, believe me, you are now their favorite band. <laughs> well, and it might it might come down like what Matt's been talking about and what you've been talking about, Janelle. You know, I mean, uh, once again, the, the the punk era. You know, we couldn't really play places initially you know nobody nobody wanted us so we opened mm -hmm. up and we played in art galleries and we played in you know parking lots and garages and stuff like that and you know maybe it is that same thing where whether you know matt's playing at a you know a, a festival or something or i think what you mentioned uh um uh you know just uh god i'm having a senior moment here drive-ins drive yeah dr well not necessarily drive-ins but even if you, have, uh, if you have like a, you know, like food is out, you know, you kind of go through and just like they set those food courts up and, you know, maybe you play there or maybe you play on your porch, like you were saying they're doing and where you're at. And maybe that's how you get around it. It's not a, it's not a big earner, but you sell some CDs and you make people happy. Maybe that's where we're at. It's, it's the little, the little things. Maybe, maybe what we could do for, with the show, Mike, is we could, maybe we could put out something to try to get people to do little small shows, micro, micro audience shows, you know, and, and like, see if we can get people to like tag us and post, you know, like, Hey, show us your, show us what you're doing in your community, you know? And awesome. yeah, we, that's good idea. Hey, and we are getting close to the top of the hour. I did want to say, Janelle, one thing I really like about you is, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're a feminist. You have a very strong, uh, you're a very strong woman, a very impassioned woman, and you don't make me feel like an asshole. Like that is such a beautiful thing okay. that you, you're, you know, you're, you're, you came here, we're having dialogue and I'm sharing my feelings. I, 
I want to learn. I want to be a better person. I want to be somebody that 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 treats everyone equally. But we all we all have little sub programs in us that happens from childhood, our media, our parents, our religions, our like all these different things. And there's good and bad in all of that, you know. And really, like life is just it, it's like a, it's you know, up to a hundred years of trying to figure out how to tweak that programming mm -hmm. so that it's, it's either, you know, it's right for the the world. It's right for other people. It helps, you know, like, and some people, they live their whole life and they'd never tweak it and, and they're miserable and they, they don't grow and they don't learn, you know? So I just wanted to tell you, I appreciate the way that you present yourself and, and, and it makes me want to be a better person. So thank you for, for that. Yay. Oh gosh, that's such and, a beautiful and... thing to say, Matt. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And you know, I think the key in life is in music is to find the common tone, you know, <laughs> when you're trying to move to the yeah. next change. Find the thing that's, you know, like a circle. A circle makes more connections than a round edge or a square edge, you know. You're gonna connect with more people if you're more like a circle. You know, and because I've done so many things, I think that empowers, enables me to allow everything, which really in life, that's what we have to do, to include mm -hmm. everything, right? So everything's included, good, bad, however you want to judge it in the moment. I appreciated you sharing honest, appreciated this dialogue. More is needed in the world. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, well, yeah. It one last thought on that if, is if, to defend all you 80s dudes out there. Steel Panther, <laughs> Steel Panther is funny because it's real. Like the, the whole chauvinistic rock star thing from the 80s. Like there are a lot of men that are like my age and, and close to it, you know, that were affected by that generation of like, you know, I'm a chick magnet you know, rock star type <laughs> mentality. Right. So obviously that could, that produced a little bit of brutishness and things in us that we got to deprogram. And, you know, it was good when you were 18, not so much when you're like 50, you know what I mean? So you have to like learn and, and change things, but. Uh, well, that was, I'm all for that. Go ahead. What? Well, I mean, that was, that was what I kind of liked about being, you know, a, uh, a, a, a punk. It's just like, you know, you inflated uh, uh, self-involved pieces of shit, you know, 70s, 80s rockers with your, you know, long hair and, and the big production values. I mean, I, I didn't really have anything against that because I, I like a lot of the music those bands did. And I like going to a show, whether it's seeing Little Shop of Horrors or seeing Kiss, you know, I mean, I, I like production values, but the attitudes that went around with that thing about we're better than somebody else. Or, right. Ego. You know, yeah. You know, that shit I hated. And that shit was one of the things that, you know, at least the community in San Francisco, we would deflate people all the time, you know? Now, oh, you well, know, that's why nerve. You think you're, you think you're sexy. Psh, psh, oh, you think you're better. Psh, psh, you know, because it was like that had to die, you know, to move the culture forward. Sadly, as I've said before on this show, as a kid who grew up through in the 60s, and here we are today. <laughs> you know, did we move, did we move the the wall at all? I don't know. I feel bad about that. It, it's funny too. Nirvana killed the ego. So like it's like the 80s was all about the ego of of like the rock star, and then Nirvana came out and just murdered the ego. Yeah, well, it's I like I'm a lot of musicians not happy about that though. There was a whole battle of, you know, Nirvana sucks or what are they doing? And why yeah. can't I gig? And you know, do I have to wear jeans and a t-shirt now? I can't wear my spandex. <laughs> I mean, it was hilarious. Well, anyway, we I'm sure we could sit here and go on about musicology for the next uh, 16 hours, but uh I got nothing to do. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Janelle's got to go. Got to go play some drums and meditate after all of this oh, vigorous come on. conversation. It's been a, it's been a joy. It's been a super joy being here with you, and I hope we get to do it again because I've really enjoyed uh, the conversation, Matt. It's been awesome meeting you, Michael. Our relationship is just you know so long and so deep, and 
twisted ro river. I'm looking forward to the future of it all and to see how we create the future together. Well, I mean, uh, to Matt's, not so much on the sexual side of Matt's point, but, you know, but but the, the, the tenor of it, you know, you have been so awesome with, uh, you know, getting involved with this now gen drum things and being, you know, a, a fire starter and a supporter and such just an awesome person to like, yeah, let's do this. You know, not a lot of people would have joined me on this journey, you know, to once again, fight the power and bring more, uh, you know, shine the spotlight on younger people and female drummers, you know. Oh, talk about that, Mike. Tell Sorry. them about your website. Tell them about the new well, website. Well, it's, it's just nowgendrums.com. Uh, Janelle is on board, thankfully. Uh, she's got a couple of great Udu tracks up there. If you want to listen to her music therapy tracks, they're up there for everybody to listen to. And we, also, we actually have a COVID calm page up there where all the contributors to the, uh, the website have, have put things up. Uh, uh, Clem, who we've had on the show, Matt, who's mm -hmm. in Sephora. She's yeah. one of the co-founders. She's got uh, some meditation stuff up there. Um, Dana Parker, who has said yeah. she just said rock and roll, Janelle. She's she's one of oh, our yeah, yeah. founders too. She's nice. got some amazing marimba tracks. So we are trying to uh, not only inspire women and young people to to rise up and be as awesome as they can be, but we're also trying to look at the culture right now and go. What does the community need, you know, to calm mm -hmm. down, and feel better about about this? And Janelle's yeah. had a lot of awesome ideas. She's, you know, always positive all the time. She's always like, "Let's do this, let's do this." You know, she's she's great about that. And uh, you know, I also want to thank uh, not only you, Janelle, but also Mara and Steve Walton, Dana. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay McDonald, Toby Simmons. Uh, yeah. You know, the people that have kind of joined us on this little episode today and have kind of powered us forward. Thank you so much for your support of the Kingdom of Rock. And that's going to be a wrap for today. Thank you, Janelle Burdell. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Oh, Janelle, real quick, where can they find you? Everywhere. Under Udu Girl. That's why I put my name is AKA Udu Girl. She's my right. superpower, and sound is her superpower. And uh, it's a sound that causes you to listen. And so check me out on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, any way you can. I am also Rhythm Games as well, but mainly Girl is where to go. I will have some releases coming out later this year that feature the drum cool. like never before. Features uh, Bigiti Kamalo from Paul Simon's band, myself on drums, June Millington on guitar. It's really unique from hip hop to electronica, bass lines to melody. It's going to be cool, guys. So I look forward to sharing more music in the future, too. Awesome. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, that's great. We don't, I don't know if we, we, we're still trying to put someone together for next week, but Matt, why don't you tell them about uh, what we have planned for uh, October 13th? Oh, um, well, let's see. Oh, uh, we have Avril Lavigne's music director, oh. Steve. Uh, Steve Ferlazzo, is that how you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another Sorry, Italian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's going to be on the 13th uh, next week. And also um, we are going to do a couple of uh, new concepts. We're going to do like a Beatles themed series you know bring in artists that have been affected by the beatles music and we can all talk about that and then you know like zeppelin we'll do like a black sabbath you know just we're going to do little chunks of different uh roots of music or rock modern rock music so uh look forward yeah, to that cool and also uh if you have any insights about the Beatles coming up. You don't have to be a, a rock star, you know, get onto the Kingdom of Rock Facebook page and give us some comments. Maybe we can use some of what you've got going on. And yeah. also see Kevin here is talking about my Bowie in the background, which is actually yeah. <laughs> sneaker. So you got you gotta pull them are they in the box? No, well they're they're just black, but oh okay. I went for the, <laughs> but oh. good Good eye, Kevin. <laughs> and one last thing, one last shameless plug, which Janelle, this is this will be good for you too. Uh, we made a Spotify playlist, so it's called Kingdom of Rock Show Guest, I believe, is what it's called. 
Um, but go, go at us there. I'll put the link out there for everybody, but, uh, all the artists that have been on the show get 10 songs they can add to the playlist. So once you get your right. album done, we can, uh, we can get it all out there. Super. I appreciate it. All right, cool. That's going to be it for today. Matt Gibson, Michael Melinda, Thanks, Janelle guys. Burdell, Woo. Kingdom of Rock out. That's up.